Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. I'm really excited today. Today we have Eldon Yellowhorn with us of the Piccany Nation, who is a professor of First Nation Studies and Archaeology at Simon Fraser University. Uh, he also co-authors these absolutely brilliant books for young adults with Kathy Lowinger. They're working on the last one at the moment, or the third one, but they all they critically acclaim Turtle Island, the story of North America's first people, and what the eagle sees as well. And you said that the one you're writing now is all about knowledge passed down from the First Nations. Yes, yes, the Sky Wolf's Call, which is uh, the gift of indigenous knowledge. I, so I'm really looking forward to seeing, I've had a look at them online and they look absolutely brilliant. Uh, such a unique idea to put them in, put the, the field in context for young people as well. I love the way you've done it and how you've taken them back in time to tell the story. Well, thank you. Okay, today, we're going to talk um, a bit more about a certain one one person in Alberta history and his interaction with the First Nations. But first of all, just to give people who don't know Canadian history a proper outline, we have to go all the way back to the Ice Age to find the very first people in North America, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And that's why I, I start, like studying archaeology, because uh, it does give me that opportunity to gain insight into those very ancient people. How many tribes are we looking at um, for the First Nations in Canada? Uh, well, uh, First Nations is a political uh, term, so mm. there are it kind of evolved out of the old Indian reserves, you know. So now instead of calling them Indian reserves, we call them First Nations, and so there are about uh, 625 of them across Canada. Uh, but when you look at overarching, uh, there are different languages, 11 different language families, uh, and. Probably the, the largest is the Algonquin, and, and that's probably also the most ancient. And then uh, in the north, we have the Dene and Inuit, uh, and uh, on the west coast, which is also the most uh, linguistically diverse area of Canada, is the west coast. A couple of those names are familiar, but it's just, to my shame, is something that I, I did mention to you that I'd studied a, a Cree war hero before, but something that I just don't know that much about. Um, so when do we first see the outside settlers arriving in the Alberta area, which is what we're looking at today? Uh, well, the, uh, in, in fact, uh, when you look at Blackfoot, uh, the Blackfoot language, which I speak, our, our term for uh, white man is uh, not big one, uh, but we uh, refer to Frenchman as Nitapikwan, which literally translates as the first a white man. Mm. So uh, we can therefore think that the first white people that uh, the Blackfoot met were uh, Frenchmen who were uh, these uh, kind of wandering merchants who would bring goods into the camps in exchange for furs that they could take back with them. And then this sort of becomes... Um much more commercial, doesn't it? So can you tell us who the Hudson Bay Company are? Well, uh, officially, uh, unofficially. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> company, yeah. It, it, it was a mercantile uh, corporation, one of the first corporations in the world. Uh, but it was unofficially, it was also the uh, economic arm of British uh, imperialism in North America. Mm -hmm. So it had this dual role of being both uh, the advance guard of a new economic system, uh, but also the advance guard of a new political system. The places where people were traveling to uh, at that time for Europeans were very remote and getting to them was very difficult. So, uh, and, and really, you know, like a lot of people have this mistaken notion that the native people were op openly hostile, but that's not the case. I mean, a, a lot of these uh, fur traders uh, could travel freely about Indian country, do their business, and, and you know, other than individual skirmishes where people get into fist fights or arguments, uh, there really isn't any, like, coordinated uh, hostilities. So they're, they're not there, the Hudson Bay Company, to um, expand influence in terms of territory, but they're there to trade then primarily. No, they were there uh, for territory as well, because when you look at people like Alexander uh, Mackenzie, uh, everywhere he went, you know, as soon as he saw a new country, the, the native people lost whatever ownership uh, they thought they had, and instead it all became uh, part of the British Empire because uh, a white man had seen that country. So in terms of the Hudson Bay Company, um, 
they've got their eye on Rupert's Land, haven't they? That's the name that they've slapped on it. Oh, sure. You know, Rupert's Land, you know, in, in Canada, it has, it has a big motif in, in uh, history, in our history, because it's all tied to the fur trade. And uh, Prince Rupert was a, a cousin of King Charles II. And so King Charles granted his cousin uh, exclusive rights to trade in all the waters draining into Hudson's Bay, which I was, a, they didn't even know how big the territory was that they were uh, granting this monopoly. Uh, it was all kind of whimsical. Uh, so then the Hudson's Bay Company then had to go out and determine what exactly uh, their trading monopoly meant and uh, where it could be uh, practiced. And, and then, and, you know, like once they, uh, so all the rivers leading into Hudson's Bay, that's all the waters right up to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it's like, like they've stuck a pin in a map and, and not comprehended how massive it is, have they? Exactly, exactly, you know. And so all of these uh, men who were going out as fur traders, they were also reconnoitering the land uh, to, you know, send reports back and tell them exactly the lands that they had discovered. And so they have got their eye on Rupert's Land, the Hudson Bay Company. Um, whereabouts is it geographically um, in terms of today so that we know? And which of the two First Nations are we talking about that live there that are going to come into contact with them? Well, the first ones that they had who were there, and, and you know, Hudson's Bay is named after Henry Hudson, who sailed in there in, in 1610, and then his uh, men mutinied against him and set him adrift. And, and they sailed back to England, and, and nobody ever heard of uh, what happened to Henry Hudson and his son and a few other who were loyal to him. So that's like 1610, and, and so the Hudson Bay Company uh, took that name, and that made, made it the center of their enterprise. So all the rivers draining, and Hudson's Bay is a huge bay. Like, it's in the northern part of Canada. Uh, if you go straight down from Greenland, uh, you come into the Davis Strait, it goes around Labrador, and between Labrador and Greenland. And once you round that, you're, you're about to hit Baffin Island, but then you go south, and that's how you get into uh, Hudson's Bay. And the bay itself is large, and so all the rivers are, are both on the west side and the east side. So there was a time when people referred to western Rupert's Land and eastern Rupert's Land. And, and eastern Rupert's Land were all those rivers flowing in uh, from what is today northern, northern Quebec, northern Ontario. And then Western Rupert's Land was uh, northern, well, Man northern Manitoba, and then into Saskatchewan and, all, and Alberta, right up to the Rocky Mountains. So, who was Anthony Henday? We don't know that much about yeah, him, do we, beforehand? No, we don't know much about him before or after his time in the, in the fur trading uh, company. Uh, we do get glimpses of him. He was from, uh, I think, the... Orkney Islands, which are mm -hmm. up off the coast of uh, Scotland, and and now in those uh, in those days when when those merchant ships set out from London, they would sail up the east coast of uh, England, and then they'd stop. Their last stop was in the Orkneys, and they would load up with provisions and uh, hire a few men, and then uh, travel across to to their main depot, which was at uh, York Factory on the shores, western shores of Hudson's Bay. And Anthony Hendy was one of the fellows who was uh, conscripted into the enterprise, well, maybe drafted. He wanted work, and they were willing to give him work. Uh, it was a long ways away from where he uh, lived. But a lot of these men went, you know, for adventure because uh, it was a break from their, from their usual lives. And many of them didn't have very great lives to start with in England. And so uh, an opportunity to get out of that uh, was present with the, with the Hudson's Bay Company. There's also a, a suggestion, isn't there, that he had some uh, a bit of criminality in his past as well? Yeah, yeah. He was a bootlegger running uh, illegal whiskey trade across uh, from Scotland, I guess. Or maybe it would be Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does so he's going to be the one that goes out there for the Hudson's Bay Company? How does it come to be mm -hmm. him? Was he uniquely qualified? Well, you know, I from my reading of it, uh, it was his it was his uh, acuity in the in the Cree language. Like he he was he 
I think he was illiterate in English mm. because we don't have any kind of uh, like a, a firsthand account written by him. The accounts that we do know of are all uh, recitations that he told to, uh, to his superiors once he got back to York Factory. And then uh, subsequently, uh, people rewrote that uh, original manuscript. And uh, the fourth, uh, there were four uh, manuscripts, and the last one was written like in, seven, in the early 1770s. And, and so it's like uh, almost 20 years after he uh, made that trip, and, and certainly after he had left uh, the trade. Because he was, uh, I think he was in Ill illiterate in English, but his ability to speak Cree, and Cree was an oral tradition, so it didn't matter if he was illiterate, you know. Uh, they just, he learned the Cree language, and, and he, seemed to, he seemed to learn it very well that he could converse in it, and uh, had no... Uh, problems uh, communicating with his fellow travelers who were all Cree and then even had a Cree wife. So uh, his access to that language is, is what I think made him uh, the person that they opted to choose. The reason that he's um, significant historically is this, these four journals that you mentioned, but there's real contention, isn't there, about how they got left behind, like you said, because he didn't write this stuff down and how they came to exist and at whose hands. Yeah, I mean, the, these were the people who were his uh, immediate supervisors at, at Hudson's Bay, and then and then they continued on in the trade uh, well into the late uh, 18th century. Uh, so periodically, somebody had a need for this, and they just wrote another manuscript as if it was uh, recited to them by Hende. But Hende was the first uh, Anglophone who who left Hudson's Bay and traveled out to the grasslands to the to the open prairie and met the indigenous people on the grasslands. Yeah, so in two weeks, doesn't he? He per penetrates further into the heartland of Canada uh, than any Hudson's Bay company employee yet. Yeah, yeah, because the only other person who had gone out was almost a century earlier, and that was uh, um. Oh, his, his name escapes me. Uh, it'll come to me in a little bit. But I just suddenly didn't call his name. Uh, but yeah, there was only one other person, and, and that other uh, uh, fellow, uh, uh, the northern part of Lake Winnipeg, uh, Henry, uh, Henry Kelsey was his name. Sorry, yeah, mm -hmm. that's his name. Henry Kelsey was the, one of the first Anglophones to go, but he didn't go that far. I mean, he didn't reach the prairies. He he got mainly into the boreal forest, to the edge of the boreal forest. So how long does it take his party then to make contact with the First Nations people that they're looking for? Well, he left Hudson's Bay in uh, late June of uh, 1754, and it took up most of the summer to travel out to the plains. And then he actually, and his... And his uh, the people he wanted to meet were the ancestors of the Blackfoot people. You know? And uh, it, he never met them until uh, October, early October. So it, it was uh, four months and a bit uh, to make it out to the plains. And so he just didn't have enough time to go back uh, before winter started. Yes, it's so, a strenuous journey, isn't it? I've definitely read oh, yeah. about canoeing and uh, a, an absolute nightmare they had trying to canoe through one part. So, I mean, it's over land, it's over water, uh, and it's into... Uh, is it mapped or is it totally unknown territory? Uh, well, uh, it, for the Cree, it wasn't unknown yeah. territory. <laughs> they, 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 it, was their regular, it was their regular route to get out to the prairie because they, the, they were the intermediaries. You know, they would... Uh, trade with the Hudson's Bay Company and then travel out to the prairies in the springtime and uh, tr do their trading with the Indians to get uh, uh, the in uh, indigenous people on the plains to get furs and then uh, brought those back down to the uh, Hudson's Bay Company. So in fact, uh, the fur trade kind of liberated them from uh, doing their own trapping mm. uh, and they could actually use this, uh, their position uh, as a uh, intermediary between the tribes to the west and, and the Hudson's Bay Company at the coast. Right, I'm going to probably completely butcher this, but I'm going to try. So in terms of the Cree, the man that heads this up is Atakisish? 
Is that right? Atticus's. Atticus's, Atticus's, Atticus's nearly. Yeah. But being British, yeah, they gave close. him an easier name to pronounce and just called him Little Dip, <laughs> didn't they? We do that in England. We call people Bob if we can't say their name, but they called him Little Dip, but it was Atticus's. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, was, he was the fellow who um, led Hindi out to the prairies because he knew how, he knew the footpaths and trails where, where the best places to cross rivers and easiest place to cross rivers I see you know, where water is kind of shallow. But then also, you know, they're, they're into in, going in there in the summertime. So they've already uh, passed the peak flood season in the spring. And so now uh, they're traveling on, on rivers, not as strenuous, but then once they started traveling on foot, uh, if they got to a, a river crossing, probably in the middle of summer, it, it wouldn't be as deep or running as fast as in the springtime. In terms of the crew's motivations for dealing with the Hudson's Bay Company then, I mean, you've already explained that this enables them not to do their own trapping because they can make money off of uh, facilitating the Hudson's Bay. Are they exploited or are they doing well out of it? Oh, no, they're doing very well, you know, uh, and in fact, they were uh, jealous of uh, of their trade, you know, and they were reluctant to bring in the white men out to the prairies because that would then cut out their position, you know, and, and so they were uh, reluctant to take Hende with them, but uh, since they already had good relations with the uh, Hudson's Bay Company officials, uh, they decided to take him up on it, but I, I think also that they knew that they weren't they were not losing anything eh? because they also uh, recognized that their customers who were the people on the plains uh, were more comfortable riding horses than they were uh, paddling canoes, and so they wouldn't be making the trip down there. Hendy has a very specific purpose doesn't he uh, that he's supposed to achieve when he gets out to the plains can mm -hmm. you tell us about it yeah yeah the main reason he was traveling out there and, and this was one of the reasons the Cree were rel reluctant to uh, you know, go along with him is that uh, his mission was to convince the native people on the prairies to undertake that long trip down to Hudson's Bay to do their trading and to travel back to the plains and, and to try to do that all in one, uh, in one season. And uh, <clears throat> it was a tough sell. I think even the Cree uh, knew that. And so uh, when they got out to the prairies, they knew their customers and, and so recognized that they, were, they really had nothing to lose uh, by introducing Hende to the uh, people out on the prairies. Yeah, just let him get on with it because he's not going to get the answer he's looking for anyway, basically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you've written I, in your article, I love the description you gave of the meeting. Can you tell us about it? Oh, yeah. There was a, well, the, Hendy actually gives a couple of uh, instances where uh, he observes the native people using this uh, sign language. And the sign language was kind of a lingua franca among the uh, people's language. They, they all had this common uh, sign language that they, they, they could use to communicate. And so the first uh, meeting that he has where he sees this happening, you know, uh, the people who, would, uh, who were uh, t talking to or telling him this story was, uh, were the Assiniboines, and, and they were also uh, considered enemies of uh, Blackfoot, you know, and, so they uh, meet them, and he learns that the people that he wants to meet had just killed some of their party. Uh, and, but he continues to go on. And then uh, eventually he does make, a, he does make contact with uh, the Native people, the Blackfoot, like ancestors of the, Black, ancestors of the Blackfoot people. And for them, you know, it, uh, they were not unaware of white people, you know. Uh, they had experience with uh, French merchants already. So it was just kind of a continuation of uh, outside trade for them. But when they do uh, invite Hende to meet them at their camp, uh, he sees several things that are very instructive. Uh, because for one thing, this is Hende's account 
you see, uh, well, there's only one other account uh, by uh, another fellow named Matthew Cocking, but that's about 20 years later. Uh, but Anthony Henday saw the Blackfoot people at the height of their power uh, as, a, as an equestrian uh, warrior culture uh, who were hunting buffalo and you know, living off the land and being a mobile society. And this was before uh, the first smallpox uh, pandemic. So they were, they were still a robust. Subsequently, uh, you know, when uh, other people met them, a lot of things had happened. So they were yeah. a much attenuated version of themselves. Um, but he had a, he had a very positive uh, image of their uh, community. You know, we need to meet, if I did meet them. I was going to ask you, um, he doesn't leave. I, I was going to say, is there a tangible legacy to his visit? Because he doesn't get what he wants, does he? But I guess it's the observation, no. isn't it? It's the fact that we have yeah, this account yeah. of them at the height of their power. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and one of the things that uh, Hende did uh, report is, you know, details about the, the people that he was, uh, he was in communication with. Uh, like the fact that they had pottery and he says, you know, they, they need nothing from us. They, they make everything themselves from, you know, products of the country. Uh, they had pottery, uh, so they didn't need uh, pots because uh, they could make their own, you know, and uh, they didn't have to wait until somebody came into their camps to trade for them. And also the, the, the Blackfoot grew their own tobacco, you know, this is a, a significant observation because uh, th- that became kind of controversial uh, about like, where did they? Where did that tobacco come from? Uh, and he actually you know, ta- describes it. Gives a and and I think you know when he first when he meets the first Blackfoot warriors who were scouts, kind of reconnoitering their frontier of their country, and they meet this uh, white man. Uh, he uh, has tobacco, and that's something that they recognized immediately, and that he had plenty of it because he gave them each a certain amount. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then this uh, opens up trade relations that I think would have been otherwise uh, more difficult. You know? He doesn't leave immediately, does he? We're sort of blessed, if you like, with a whole winter's worth of the account, aren't we? Because as you mentioned, it took four months to get out there. Yeah, and, it, and the rivers were not uh, full of water at that point, so it would have been really difficult to travel on. Actually, in, the, in late summer, they can get quite shallow. Uh, but also the fact that he and his Cree companions were able to spend the entire winter in Blackfoot country and not fear for their lives. I mean, that gives you an idea that there was a lot, generally peaceful relations between the Indian people. Uh, and uh, you know, they, they recognized that their, this trade was as valuable to them as it was to uh, their Cree partners. He lived with a family, didn't he? Yes, yes, he uh, had. Over the winter, he kind of became, uh, became responsible for uh, a small family because they uh, they were a large party and so in order for them to live off the land they had to break into smaller uh, groups and he kind of became one of the de facto leaders of, of one of the little bands. What does he tell us what are the most important things he tells us in terms of uh, an outsider's perspective about the first nations in the area at that time? Well, uh, he saw them kind of in their primordial culture where they were uh, still uh, unaware of the globe beyond uh, their their own country. So they still had this very uh, parochial view of the world. And so they were the producers and consumers of everything that they uh, needed or required. And uh, they still had, a, they still had their independence uh, at that point, you know, one that became less so as they became more involved in the trade, because there were a lot of things that went uh, extinct with the with the fur trade. For example, uh, once guns came uh, common, people stopped working uh, stone tools, and in fact, uh, for a while there, the, the Hudson's Bay Company was even uh, making uh, iron arrow tips and trading those to the native people when they still had bows and arrows. Uh, there was a lot of uh, knowledge. Like 1800 was the last year the Blackfoot grew their own tobacco. And I know this from uh, reading uh, David Thompson's narrative, and he actually uh, used that date and uh, 
you know, after that, tobacco is just so much more easy to get uh, for from the uh, from the fur traders. He seems to have been a very unassuming presence within the First Nations. He's not sort of going in there and expecting fealty to be paid to him, is he? He's just like he's an observer, and he's not a judgmental observer either. By the no. sounds of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and I think one of the one of the reasons that this comes about is that uh, Hende himself was not from uh, the class of people in, in his, uh, his home country. He was not from the class of people who would uh, see themselves as better than everybody else. Mm. Uh, he was uh, he, he saw them as his equals because uh, they, as he said, they need nothing from us, and they you know we're the ones who are dependent on their uh, goodwill. He's kind of an enigmatic figure isn't he because we don't know <laughs> anything about after <laughs> yeah yeah but i you know i just speculate on what his life must have been like after he got back to to london because you know i don't know if he had any children although he you know he was with the same Cree woman for uh many years and uh the possibility of them not having children is just uh, hard to imagine so he must have had a family uh, that he had to leave behind because oftentimes, well, not oftentimes, but every time that uh, men left the, left the company when their service was done, uh, they just had to leave their families behind. Like a lot of them had country wives, they called them, or um, they used that euphemism, you know, the marriage in the style of the country. Yeah. Different, uh, different um, postcodes it's allowed, I think people try and say now. Yeah. It's a similar concept. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's a yeah, it's, it's a perennial, it's a perennial institution in humanity. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the one um, in every port, isn't he, it? Yeah, yeah, you know, like there's there are there are some trade names, uh, fur trade names, that are very common across uh, Western Canada, and it it happens that you know the fur trader who was from a certain location in the Orkneys then was posted at different posts across uh, Western Canada. And each post, he had a new wife and uh, started a new family. And so these names uh, are all stemming from the same individual. It's quite funny. This so is like an 18th country. century sperm oh, donor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was, there was a lot of uh, you know, trade going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in many different ways. Um, how does history view him, given that we we can't really give definitive facts about him? How is he viewed in history? You know, uh, anybody who writes about him only speculates. I mean, we mm. have such a narrow window, uh, a narrow you know, insight into his into his life, and that's just from his that trip that he makes. But I, I, I imagine, you know, once he got back to England, he must have been horribly lonely. Uh, as someone who like, went out that yeah. way last year and I really? did south of the border though I did like Nebraska and Montana and South Dakota and things and seen those wild open spaces and is now locked up in southwest London I feel his yeah. pain yeah I <laughs> know <laughs> because it, what what he left behind wasn't just his family and his wife it was also his freedom mm. because he was you know, you know in a very class-based society that he left and then he went out into this relatively egalitarian uh, working system and then had to go back and uh, into a life that he, he really didn't uh, feel comfortable with anymore. In terms of being the first Anglophone to go into the area, is he viewed as sort of a founding father of Alberta? Does he get any attention for that? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, he gets all the attention <laughs> for that, <laughs> <laughs> which must just be hugely ironic for someone of First Nation heritage. Oh, it, it kind of is because uh, that's one of the things that I've, uh, as an archaeologist, I've also studied is how people use the past uh, and mm. how uh, every generation reinvents the purpose that it, it wants to uh, in, invest in history. So, is so, he currently? Because we're we're looking at an era at the moment where people are hugely uncomfortable and attempting to redefine um, imperialism and conquest and and how do, how do people view him within that I suppose he's a cog in he's a he's a cog in the machine isn't he he's not like you no. say he's not of the class that perpetrated he just is a guy that was there 
Yeah, and also, you know, because uh, Alberta itself is looking like the, the province of Alberta that is most closely associated with Anthony Hende, uh, they really lionize him. They see him as like the founding father of the province. Mm. He, he traveled through Saskatchewan to give Alberta, but in Saskatchewan, they don't see Anthony Hende as being the founding father of the province. You know? Because he of, kept uh, going. He wasn't interested. Yeah, he didn't he like what he saw, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> he was just an itinerant, you know? Yeah. <laughs> He just burnt through there on his way to something better, is what you're saying in Alberta. Yeah, and that's what all Albertans always think. We're better than Saskatchewan. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of border rivalry going on. Yeah, there's a little bit of rivalry between the two provinces, you know. And 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 so you know, Anthony Hendes uh, has a big presence in Alberta history. In fact, if you ever travel to the uh, city of uh, Cal on um, Edmonton, uh, which is the provincial capital there in Alberta. Freeway named after him, Anthony Hende Drive, uh, and it connects uh, the north part of the city with the south part of the city. Because yet there's a the North Saskatchewan River bisects the city, so there's the provincial legislatures on the north side of the city, and, and then everything uh, on the south is like the, the university is there and all that. So mm. they need some kind of a connection, and Anthony Hende Drive is that connector. Thank you so much, Eldon, for coming on to talk to us about the First Nations in Alberta and their early contact with uh, settlers moving into the area. Yeah, no, at that point, they still had a great deal of uh, agency in, uh, and, and this carried on right through to the end of the, to the 18th century. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then as uh, the 19th century rolled around, you know, there were more protracted contact and, and that's when people were kind of marginalized and, and dis, dispossessed by outside powers. And in terms of the, the people that belong in that area, uh, the Blackfoot and the Cree, are they still there? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh, Blackfoot, uh, we have three reserves in, in Alberta and then one reserve in Montana. So we're one of those Blackfoot country kind of... Uh, Stretch across the Rocky Mountains and the uh, West Canada were kind of neatly dissected in, in half. Join us tomorrow morning when Zach and Marcus will be back with Sharpshooters. And then in the afternoon, join Elena with Mary Hollingsworth. She talks all about her new book, Princes of the Renaissance. It's a really fascinating talk, so don't miss out on that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Elena and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.